Good morning. I am the Black Carnivore, and I'm going to be reading from Chapter 2 of Fat of the Land today. I was really excited to put together this project. It's great to collaborate with other uh, carnivores in this space, and uh, this was just really a lot of fun. So enjoy, and uh, let me get started. Chapter 2, The Home Life of Stone Age Man. Those who speculate on prehistoric man usually think he lived on meat, and particularly so in the northern lands of the world but during the Ice Ages. They go on to say in books and journals that fat meat is a good diet for strenuous living in cold weather, and to specify that in low temperatures one needs to stoke the internal fires with the fuel of high caloric value, meaning fat. These theorizers frequently go on to say that Paleolithic man, who hunted the reindeer and musk ox in Middle Europe thousands of years ago, was in a stage of culture similar to that of the Eskimos who have been found in the Arctic during modern times, hunting the same animals using stone implements like those of prehistoric man and dressing in skins. Seemingly, then, nutritionists who reason, as I have sketched, believe that the modern Stone Age Eskimo fights the cold through burning up physiologically a lot of protein and especially a lot of fat. The evidence will show, however, that the Eskimo requires no more food than a Scotsman, or at least not through living where the weather is colder. Perhaps the best phrase solution to this problem is that of the late Archdeacon Hudson Stock of the Protestant Episcopal Mission for Yukon, Alaska. That post has nearly or quite the lowest temperature recorded for Alaska, 79 degrees or perhaps 80 degrees below zero. And this was known to an audience whom the missionary addressed during what proved to be the last lecture tour through the States in 1919. A woman rose to question him. Archdeacon, we simply cannot understand how you managed to endure the terrible cold at Fort Yukon. Stuck replied, Madam, we do not endure any cold at Fort Yukon. We live in houses, we burn fuel, and when we go outdoors, we put on clothing. This correct answer has within it the right solution to the problem, whether Ice Age man required a diet specifically high in calories which, with which to fight the cold. Biologically speaking, he could not have fought it and still survived to become our ancestor. For the human animal seems incapable of more than ins insignificant biological adaptation to cold. He does not have feathers as grouse do. He does not have fur as rabbits do. He would freeze to death long before he could develop through, a mo for, through evolutionary process either of these forms of protection. The little hair he has on the body is not well distributed for keeping him warm, nor does he grow fur at the roots of the hairs, as with many dogs. His fat has a tendency to gather in certain restricted localities and does not spread over his whole body as a shield beneath the skin like the blubber of a seal. Indeed, few things are more nearly self-evident than the complete biologic failure of man to adapt himself to a climate of chill winters. This means that African, European, and Greenlander are all on equal footing here. Admiral Peary is on frequent record that his best traveling companion was Matthew A. Henson, an African. Cape Verde Islanders, Canary Islanders, and Hawaiians were favored personnel of the Yankee whaling fleet when it is used to winter in the northwestern Canadian Arctic. Um, one of the best men of my third Arctic expedition was a Samoa Islander. An Italian polar expedition under a, a member of the royal family, the Duke of Abruzzi, took the farthest north record away from the Norwegians and did it, as the narrative of the expedition shows, less through skill than brute endurance. But I need not labor a point that is now generally considered. Either man has not been away from his ancestral top tropics long enough for evolutionary adaptation, or else his t trend of change is not in the direction of bodily adjustment to sub-zero cold. Why should it be, when all he needs in order to be safe and comfortable in the Arctic is to adapt his mind, his ideas? As for us Europeans, we do not even have to make new discoveries, if only we have the humility to borrow the technique of the Eskimos and not to start trying to improve on it until we have first learned to grasp its principles and apply its practice. It is doubtful that man has anywhere else on earth managed an adjustment to environment so nearly perfect as that of the Eskimo to his Arctic. 
Going from Mexico towards northern and wooded Canada, the amount of caloric energy from food required by the Indian contest with environment does increase with fair regularity, for there is not evident a satisfactorily progressive adjustment of clothes and housing to the increased length and chill of the winter. But at the northern edge of the forest, that process is abruptly reversed, for on the Arctic prairies, one meets a culture which ceases to fight environment and instead deals with it by adaptation. No caloric energy is then needed for a struggle with the cold because there is no, no such struggle. The difference between a Scotsman and an Eskimo dealing with cold resembles a difference between a human swimmer who comes up when necessary for air and a fish which does not need to come up for air at all. Johnny Weissmuller is tense, active, burns a lot of fuel in a struggle. A codfish lets the water cover him and is relaxed under conditions of biological economy. I take for an example the case of the Eskimos of the Mackenzie and the Coronation Gulf before Europeans interfered. Changing what should be changed, as the scholastic reasoners used to say in Latin, the picture applies, likely enough at least in considerable part to the living conditions of our Stone Age and Ice Age forebearers. Eskimo ways of living, as the f first explorers found them, and probably those of Northern Hemisphere man in the Ice Ages, when glaciers covered large parts of North America and Eurasia, were badly adapted to warm weather. Ice Age man endured summer, no doubt, as Australians and Italians now endure winter. When continental Eskimos go inland, they meet terrific heat, humid temperatures running toward 100 degrees Fahrenheit in the shade, with the nights almost as hot as the days, the unsettling sun beating upon them the 24 hours through. The best they can do for cool garments is to use nearly worn out skin clothes full of holes. Through every hole the mosquitoes sting, the sand flies get in and crawl around biting like fleas. The only protection from the insects is the smoke, and the insects can stand more smoke than the Eskimos can. In old-fashioned language, summer is hell on earth as long as the wind blows off the land. When the summer wind blows off the sea, it brings fog and chills, chill rains to men who live near the shore. Skin clothes then are of little protection. Garments of mammal intestines shed rain, and so does the hide of the seal when rightly prepared. But even then, Stone Age clothes do not approach the moisture-resistant qualities of our waterproofs and umbrellas. The houses of last winter leak and no one remains in them during the summer. The skin tents in which people live get soggy and rot if the damp weather lasts. With the Eskimo summer and the Italian winter, the condition is one in both cases people just endure and long for the change of season. In Texas, summer brings the normal conditions of the year. In Arctic Canada, winter brings them. The Canadian Eskimo has been nearly a prisoner from May to September. It is impractical for him to cross rivers by swimming, and in any case, most Eskimos have no idea how to swim. The lakes, which in his country cover half the surface of the earth, must be detoured. The ground is boggy and one's feet sink in. The clay is sticky and one's boots are clogged with it. The insects make life a torment. One is wretched part of the time because he is wet, and if not wet, he is sweltering with the heat. All of this, the frost of autumn change. The insects die or go to sleep. The lakes and rivers freeze over and one can walk across them. The snow arrives and the whole land becomes a sledge road which leads in every direction. Winter clothes and winter houses which have been developed to meet the normal weather of the year bring an average of comfort that seems to the Stone Age Eskimo as pleasant as the usual comfort of Park Avenue does to the New Yorker. In a discussion that covers that considers everything from the dietetic point of view, there is no t there is not time to explain fully the Eskimos' clothes, how the materials are prepared, and how the garments are made. The books, however, including some written by me, have covered this subject in detail. See especially the author's Arctic Manual, but also Hunters of the Great North: My Life with the Eskimo and the Friendly Arctic. I simply state then that the clothes the Eskimos wear in the Arctic during the coldest months of the year, January or February, weigh under 10 pounds, which is a good deal less than the winter equipment of the average New York businessman. These clothes are soft as velvet, and it is only a slight exaggeration to say that the wearers have to use a test to find out whether the day is cold. At 40 degrees below Fahrenheit, a Mackenzie Eskimo or a white man dressed in their style sits outdoors and chats almost as comfortably as one does in a thermostat-regulated room. 
The cold, about which the polar explorer can read upon the scale of the thermometer, will touch only those parts of the body which are exposed, the face and the inside of the breathing apparatus, a small fraction of the body needing little fuel for counterbalance. Warm and completely protected elsewhere, he can sit comfortably even with the bare hands. Indeed, the ears, particularly liable to frost, seem to be about the only parts likely to freeze if exposed at 40 below zero, while most of the rest of the body is warm. This holds only during calm weather. A strong wind at negative 20 degree Fahrenheit or negative 30 degree Fahrenheit will freeze almost any exposed part of the body if given time. But Eskimo clothes are nearly windproof as part of being nearly cold proof, so that even in a wind, little caloric energy is needed for counterbalancing a low temperature. The houses of Mackenzie River, typical in their warmth of the dwellings of most Eskimos, have frames of wood with, with a covering of earth so thick that, practically speaking, no chill enters except as planned ventilation for which a, a diving bell principle of control is used. A room filled with warm air can lose no great amount of it through an opening in the floor, while the cold air below that opening is not able to rise into the house appreciably faster than the warm air escapes at the top. The roof ventilator of a dwelling that shelters 20 or 30 people is likely to resemble, resemble our stove pop, stove pipes in diameter. This makes fairly good ventilation for there may be a temperature difference of from 100 degrees to 150 degrees between indoors and out. With that gradient, the house air is so much lighter than the general atmosphere that the difference produces a ter terrific pressure and the warm air rushes out as a forced draft. Air for replacement enters at the floor level by a trap with an area of from 15 to 30 square feet, so, so slowly that there is no draft appreciable to the inmates. Through this diving bell control of ventilation, there develops several temperature levels within the house, or rather an upward gradation of warmth. Lying on the floor, you might be cool at 60 degrees. Sitting on the floor, the upper part of your body would be warmish at 70 degrees or 80 degrees. Sitting on the bed platform three feet above the floor, you could reach up with your hand to a temperature of 90 or 100 degrees. These temperatures in the Mackenzie District and in many other places are produced by lamps which burn animal fat, odorless, smokeless, and giving a soft yellowish light. During my first Mackenzie winter, described hereafter, there were enough lamps extinguished at bedtime, say 10 o'clock, to bring the room temperature down to 50 or 60 degrees. Both sexes and all ages slept completely naked under light robes. Before white men's influence spread over the North American Arctic, the typical Eskimo house in the afternoon and evening resembled a sweat bath rather than a warm room. When garments are made of fur, as they probably were among our, nearly, our northerly Stone Age ancestors, and as they are with the Eskimos, nakedness at such house temperatures is the only thing possible. For with constant pers perspiration, the skin clothes would decay so rapidly that, to say nothing of the smell, they would fall into pieces in a few weeks. There were, accordingly, before whites interfered, only two Eskimo styles within, within doors. For these, West Greenland and Northern Alaska, including the Mackenzie River, are typical. In Greenland, by the accounts of early travelers, men, women, and children were completely naked within doors. In Northern Alaska, children up to six or seven years of age were naked, but grown people wore breeches, outworn, outworn garments from a previous year, and old and full of holes which covered them from just above the hips to just above the knee. These might get wet with perspiration during the evening, but they would not be worn more than a few hours. Whoever put on regular clothes for outdoors would hang his indoor breeches up to dry. For the Stone Age, Eskimo realized that drying prevents decay. One person might have two or three pairs of trunks being careful that at least once every three days, each of these would get thoroughly dry. They did not have any theory about germs that flourish in warmth and moisture, but they prevented decay by a method, a method which kills the germs. In the Mackenzie house, they, were, they used to sit stripped except for the breeches from around four in the afternoon when the outdoor work was done to around 10 or 11 when it was bedtime. There were streams of perspira perspiration running down our bodies constantly, and the children were occupied in carry around, carrying around dippers of ice water from which we drank great quantities. 
Pausing for dietetic emphasis, note is made of two important conditions under which we ate our meals that were 100% meat. One, while indoors, we were living in a humid tropical environment. When outdoors, we carried the tropics around with us inside our clothes. Neither indoors nor out were we using any consider considerable part of the caloric value of our food in a biologic struggle against chill. Two, we drank with our evening meal, four o'clock dinner, some warm broth in which our meat had been boiled. However, by native custom, we never alternated bites of food and sips of drink. We might eat a whole meal without a drink, following sometimes with a dipper of warm broth and perhaps a little later taking a good round draught of cold water. At cold meals or after them, our drinks were also cold. If inexperienced in indigenous cultures, one is likely to misinterpret general statements about food. I might tell you correctly that the chief food of a certain group of Eskimos with whom I lived was caribou meat with perhaps 30% fish, 10% seal meat, and 5 or 10% made up of polar bear, rabbits, birds, and eggs. This might lead one to visualize meals where there would be a fish course followed by a meat course and where we would breakfast at least occasionally on eggs. Such is most unlikely to be the case with indigenous peoples. If 50% of the year's food is caribou meat, the, the indigenous population likely eats practically nothing but caribou during approximately half the year, seldom tasting this meat the rest of the 12 months. His fish percentages will come in similarly restricted periods, and they are likely to be fish exclusively. The eggs, far from bring, being breakfast distributed through several months, would be occasional days of nothing but eggs during only one month of the year in the spring. The Eskimo situation varies from ours still more when it comes to vegetables. In the Mackenzie diet district, these were eaten under three conditions. One, the chief occasion for vegetables here, as with most Eskimos, was famine. There were several kinds of vegetable things known to be edible, and they were resorted to in a definite succession as prejudices were overborne by the pangs of hunger. True fam famine seldom, if ever, occurred in the Mackenzie, but small groups would get short of food through some accident, and then famine produced in eating would result. Two, some vegetable foods were eaten because the Mackenzie River people liked them. These were chiefly berries, and among berries, chiefly the salmon berry or cloud berry, Rubus carmerus. The Mackenzie River people ate these only during the season, but in western Alaska and elsewhere, berries and some other vegetable foods were preserved in oil for winter, sometimes as delicacies, sometimes to guard against famine, and no doubt frequently with a mixture of both motives. motives. Three, one form of vegetable dish is eaten strictly in connection with another that is non-vegetable. The moss, twigs, and grass from a caribou stomach are used as a base for oil. In my experience, the commonest reason for this use was that someone from a distance arrived with a bag of oil that was either in a particularly delectable state of fermentation, corresponding to cam camembert cheese that is just soft enough, or else this was an oil from a favored animal not common to the district, say white whale brought into a sealing community. The question would then arise, how shall we eat this oil? Most likely there would be on hand boiled lean meat or perhaps wind-dried fish, and the matter was simple. You cut off or broke off the lean meat or the fish into bite-sized pieces, dipping each into the fat. But if no lean happened to be available, there was perhaps a suggestion that a caribou had been killed recently. The paunch was likely still in fair condition, and why not use that to make a salad? Usually the suggestion had an uneven reception, the majority perhaps agreeing and eating the oil that way, while the remainder just dip their fingers into the oil a few times and lick them off. Nobody drinks large swigs of oil, or at least this habit is not known among Eskimos. There are European districts where certain oils are drunk in limited quantities. For instance, Scandinavian fishermen often have a belief in the nearly magical value of cod or halibut liver oil, and some of them will toss off, most likely in the morning, the equivalent of a wine glass full. I have never seen a similar custom among Eskimos. The nearest to it was during one famine period where there were six Eskimos with me, five of whom ate oil soaked up with feathers or caribou hair, moss or tea leaves to make a kind of salad. But one member of our party, an aged Eskimo man, wanted his ration of oil in a teacup, about half a cup. 
He just took longer to sip it than the other Eskimos and I did to eat our salad, perhaps requiring half an hour. A white man's preference in cuts of meat will change when he switches from the average European or American diet where food is less than the combined quantity of the rest of the food to a diet that is mainly or wholly meat. It seems that in the good old days, when teeth were presumably better, the, the people of England judge meat not by its tenderness, but by ease of chewing, but by its juiciness and flavor. They condemned their meat by saying it was tasteless or dry. We disparage by calling it tough. The difference of our attitude from theirs is no doubt in part a reflection of the change to where more than 90% of even our high school children have cavities in their teeth. Quite as much, no doubt, the difference may be traced to the increased prevalence of what we think of as French cooking, where the ideal seems to be season and otherwise handle any food so that it shall taste like something else. For that sort of cooking and for the weak teeth, the ideal piece of meat is a tenderloin. Having no flavor of its own, it will readily take on whatever flavor the cook desires to confer upon it by a sauce or other device, and it is never hard to chew. The teeth of, of exclusive meat eaters are good, at least it is so with those who have, who have been brought up on meat. They use no sauce and want their meat to have a flavor of its own, so they usually feed tenderloins to dogs. When first I lived with Eskimos, I was inclined to favor the cuts I had preferred in quote-unquote civilization, but the facilities were, for roasting were poor, and often the only available fat to fry in was seal oil, which I never liked for frying meat, even though I grew to like it for other uses. In any case, it was not long before I came to agree with Eskimos on preference between different cuts of meat, and these favor mostly parts not adapted to roasting or frying. Among the Mackenzie Eskimos, the head was considered the best part of the caribou, not just the tongue and the brain, though both were relished, but the head as a whole. Among the best parts of it were the fat behind the eye and the meat, a blend of lean and fat inside the angle of the lower jaw. As to this group of taste, I have found no difference among other Eskimos, Indians of the North Forest, or white men who have lived for any considerable time exclusively on meat. Indeed, a preference for heads is met with here and there all over the world, even among people who do not live wholly on meat. In New England, for instance, chowder from fish heads is considered better than if made from other parts. After the head, come in descending order of preference, brisket, ribs, pelvis, and backbone. The principle applies that the sweetest meat is near the bone. Excess outside meat is frequently peeled off from the backbone for dog feed and is sometimes from the ribs. And in an end note, the substantial equivalent of this of this discussion was read as it appeared in an article I published some years ago by Dr. G.W. Harley, who is quoted at some length in the chapter, Living on the Fat of the Land. On the basis of 18 years as a medical missionary in tropical after Africa, Dr. Harley writes under date of September 25, 1944, the preference of Eskimos and other northern hunters for head brisket and ribs in particular interests to me personally because they are also the favorite cuts of not only the natives of, of Liberia, but among both Africans and whites in North and South Carolina. Dr. Harley is a North Carolinian by birth and is a graduate of Duke University in that state. If there are four in a family and if they have a team of eight dogs, they divide the caribou nearly half and half for two well-furred 50-pound dogs that sleep outdoors in the cold, eat about as much as one man who is well-dressed and housed. Beginning with what is least desired by the family. The dogs get the tenderloin, lungs, liver, sweetbreads, and everything else from within the body except the kidney and intestinal fat, the kidneys themselves, and the heart. Most of the meat is peeled off the hams for dog feet. Humerus and femur are saved for boiling with what meat remains on them, and these bones are broken for marrow while hot. The other long bones of fore and hind legs are cleaned of all meat and are saved up to crack for raw marrow, which may be used with a meal or in small, small quantity eaten raw between meals, somewhat as we eat candy. 
When the Hebrews praised fat things full of marrow, they knew what they were talking about. For a skinny beast does not have marrow, at least not the kind, the fat kind that our ancestors loved. When a marrow-bearing animal gets so thin that the eyes begin to recede because of the gradual disappearance of fat behind the eye, practically all fat has disappeared from the marrow, so that instead of the expected firm stick of white, you find, you find when you crack the raw marrow bone a liquid of blood color. Cooked, whether boiled or roasted, this liquid develops the consistency and somewhat the taste of a, the white of a hard-boiled egg. Hunting man is a connoisseur of fats and has a definite sequence of preference in the, in the different fats according to their origination in different parts of the body. The marrows are the best and range in excellence from hip and shoulder joints down the, the farther down the better. The marrow of humerus and femur is hard and tallowy at room temperatures, harder at the upper end. These bones are sometimes broken and the marrow eaten raw, but usually the bone with what remains of it um, after the dog meat has been peeled off is boiled and the cooked marrow is eaten warm. Passing down the leg, the marrow is softer and softer, more and more like a particular delicious cream in flavor, and, it, and is in each bone softer at the lower end of, um, than at the upper, so that if one is given a small piece in the dark, he can tell by the feel when he crushes it with his tongue against his palate and by the taste from which, the bone it, from which bone it is and from which end of the bone. To hunting man, the marrow of the long bones is the greatest delicacy he knows, except perhaps boiled moose nose or the boiled liver of the lok. The loche or ling is a freshwater fish that, although nowhere taken in large numbers, is perhaps the favorite food of the Eskimo of northern Canada and Alaska. It is especially prized for its large fatty liver. Nose and liver are improved by cooking, in his opinion, but to him the cooking of marrows, other than those of humerus and femur, is a spoiling of good food, or rather the turning of a great delicacy into a mere ordinary food. To the hunter, all caribou, caribou fats, except the marrows of the long bone, are better cooked than raw. The ratings, in descending order, are the fat from behind the eye, the kidney fat, the fat on the brisket near the bone, the fat of the ribs, and other parts where it is mixed with the lean. Last comes the back fat, which is a separate layer that begins to appear when the animal already has fat in its marrow and gets thicker as the fatness cycle advances. The Eskimos, like the Homeric Greeks, prefer the flesh of older animals to that of calves, yearlings, and two-year-olds. In the chapter, Living on the Fat of the Land, Homer is quoted to the, effect, to the effect that the Greeks preferred the meat of bulls five years old. It is approximately so with these northern forest Indians with whom I have hunted and probably with all the caribou eaters. Caribou bulls probably seldom live more than five or six years, for the older the beast, the slower it runs, and the wolves catch up with the slowest when they pursue a band. In the Natural History, Appendix to My Life with the Eskimo, Dr. R. M. Anderson, who was a naturalist and, a, and second in command of our 1908 to 1912 expedition, says, the largest slab of back fat which I have seen taken from a caribou on the Arctic coast was from a bull killed near Langton Bay in er, early in September, the fat weighing 39 pounds. A large bull killed by Mr. Stefanson on Dees River in October had back fat 72 millimeters in thickness, two and seven eighths inches. Comparing the thickness of this with the Langdon Bay, Bay specimen, the back fat of the dense river bull must have weighed at least 50 pounds. The thicker the back fat of a caribou is, the richer it, it is in proportion, the amount of connective tissue remaining the same and the additional weight consisting of an interstitial fat. The slab of back fat is thickest a little in front of the roots of the tail and goes down about halfway to the hock joint, thinning rapidly. Forward, it extends well out along the neck, thinning gradually from the hips forward. On the side, it goes down a, th a third of the way over the ribs. When a caribou is killed, the back fat is peeled off and laid on the grass or snow to harden. As Dr. Anderson says, it may r run to 50 pounds on a bull that dresses 250 to 300 pounds. The slab is thinner the younger the animal, and for the same age, is thinner with females than males. 
The fat cycle with caribou differs in timing with age and sex. The bulls are leanest in November, begin picking up flesh before Christmas, enough to make good eating of the marrow, and fatten steadily thereafter. For those who think cold weather, weather has a bearing, I note that in the Arctic, January and February are usually the coldest months of the year, with March likely to be as cold as December. The mosquitoes, usually worst in June, evidently delay and lessen the fat accumulation, for, the, for there are some grassy northern, northerly islands in the Canadian archipelago so small that they are swept through by season sea breezes chilly enough to keep the mosquitoes down, and we found in these islands that the caribou fattened earlier in the season and grew fatter in proportion to size than in the mosquito-plagued larger islands or in the still worse infested mainland. Old bulls are fat, fattest in early September, just before the rutting season. The cows are thinnest in May, when the old bulls have picked up a fifth or a sixth of the fat they were going to have. During the mosquito season, the cows begin to fatten so much more rapidly in the described islands where the flies are not bad and are at their fattest in November at the end of the rutting season, when the old bulls have lost all their fat. Therefore, as bulls get fatter, the cows get thinner until they are thinnest just before or just after fawning. The fawns, born in May or early June, have a barely perceptible back fat in September, the males slightly more than the females. Yearling and two-year-old bulls have a cycle like that of older bulls, except that they do not grow quite so fat and there, that there is a time lag, the younger bulls reaching a given stage somewhat later than the old. The fat of the blubber animals varies a little in quality by age and sex. With these, the fat of the younger is slightly preferred, which is not the case with the marrow-bearing animals, which differ also a little by age and sex, but in the reverse direction, the fat of the older being considered just a shade better. In eating seals, there may be a slight preference for the fat on the flipper, or rather the fat which there blends into a sort of gristle that is very agreeable when medium boiled. Seals do not have fatty marrow in their bones. Seal marrow, when raw, has a consistency and color of blood. When cooked, it resembles the white of hard-boiled egg, as does the marrow of an emaciated caribou. In fact, the blubber animals have fat in only one place, the layer that separates the skin from the red flesh underneath. There is no streak of the fat and no streak of the lean in their rib meat, nor indeed any fat anywhere mixed with the lean that is perceptible to eye or palate, nor do they have kidney or inter intestinal fat. Being entirely lean, the flesh of the seal is very dry as it is eaten, and this fact explains a difference in Eskimo food habits. With caribou, they usually eat each piece of meat as, as is. With seal, they like to dip each piece of lean into oil before placing it in the mouth. The groups that depend on the blubber animals are the most fortunate in the hunting way of life, for they never suffer from fat hunger. The trouble is worse so far as North America is concerned among those forest Indians who depend at times on rabbits, the leanest animal in the North, and who develop the extreme fat hunger known as rabbit starvation. Rabbit eaters, if they have no fat from any other source, beaver, moose, fish, will develop diarrhea in about a week with headache, lassitude, a vague discomfort. If, there are, if they are eating enough rabbits, the people eat till their stomachs are distended, but no matter how much they eat, they feel unsatisfied. Some think a man will die sooner as he eats continually of fat-free meat than if he eats nothing. But this is a, a b belief on which sufficient evidence for a decision has not been gathered in the North. Deaths from rabbit starvation or from the eating of other skinny meat are rare, for everyone understands the principle, and any possible preven preventative tips are usually are naturally taken. It is practically impossible for a hunter of seals and whales to run short of fat. Like all meat eaters, the sealers use about six pounds of lean for each pound of fat. When both are available, therefore, in calories, the meat eater gets about 80% of his energy from fat, the remainder from lean. Now, the makeup of seal is such that if one secures enough of them to supply the needed lean meat, he thereby se secured at least three times the amount of fat needed for food, and the same ratio of fat to lean applies in the feeding of dogs. This means that when the Eskimo has used for family and dog team what they require, he has plenty left over to burn in his lamps for light, for cooking, and for the heating of the house. 
If caribou hunters could kill in August and September all the animals they need, and if they could preserve this meat to last them through the year, they would have enough fat to eat with their lean, but even then not enough left over for fuel. In practice, most caribou hunters burn something else than fat, but they use a little tallow for lighting their houses in winter. In summer, they have the midnight sun for light, and before and after that, the bright nights. But with the greatest economy of lighting, they do not have enough fat to go with their lean since they are seldom able to kill enough bulls and fat cows in autumn to last more than half or two-thirds of the winter. For this reason, most caribou Eskimos go to the seacoast each year to hunt the blubber animals or or else they purchase bags of blubber from the coast dwellers. These bags are made by casing a seal, and each will contain from 150 to 250 pounds of seal, walrus, or whale blubber. So much for preferences in fat and the need for fat. I return to preferences in cuts of caribou lean meat, stipulating that there is considerable dependence on the varying amounts of fat mixed in with the lean. About halfway in quality are shoulder blades and neck, in which both dogs and family are interested. Often there is a compromise. The outside meat is peeled off these pieces for the dogs and the inside meat is boiled on the bone for the family. Usually the humans get the best of it. The Eskimo, where I have known him, is very considerate of his dogs, but even more so of his family. In any case, he makes between them the difference that he does not give the dogs more than he thinks good for them, but he can but countenances and is even pleased with gorging by members of the family and by visitors. The preferences are not the same with all animals. Moose, of which the Mackenzie Eskimo gets some and the Arctic Forest Indians many, are divided up the same as caribou, except that there is a special tidbit, the nose, which is rich with a particularly delectable fat and is favored in Alaska and northern Canada about as the tail of the fat tail sheep was by the ancient Hebrews and still is by the modern Arab. Eskimos do not rate the head of the mountain sheep quite as high as that of the moose or caribou. Apart from this, the order of preference is the same as with caribou, except that sheep livers are more favored than those of caribou. This is no doubt because sheep have a gallbladder that can be removed. In the family to which the caribou belongs, there is no gallbladder, and the gall is distributed throughout the liver, giving it a particular bitterish taste. In the case of sea mammals, the order is very different. With a polar bear, the kidneys are preferred and the paws if there is enough fuel to cook them, for they take a, a lot of boiling. Ribs usually come next, but there is no such strong feeling as with caribou that one part is better than the other. The head is seldom eaten by the family. The tongue is eaten, but not as a tidbit. The brain is liked, as with all animals. Polar bear liver is never eaten by the Eskimo, for they believe it to be poisonous. Trying out a dozen livers to test the belief, we found that about one in five or six makes the eater ill. The symptoms are anything from, from a mild to an excruciating headache, in the latter case with vomiting. It is believed that dogs, which have been severely quote-unquote poisoned, lose their hair. There appears to be no record that either a man or a dog ever died from eating bear liver. The cause of the trouble with bear liver is unknown, but there have been many theories. One of these is that the symptoms are produced by an overdose of vitamins in which the livers are known to be rich. There is in them, no doubt, as in other vitamin-bearing livers, a great variation in amounts contained, which has been offered as an explanation of why one may eat half a dozen livers with complete satisfaction and become violently ill on the seventh. There would be a greater danger if a second liver were eaten immediately after the first, the danger of vitamin overdosage. The liver of caribou and moose is eaten by the family occasionally, that of mountain sheep frequently, and that of the seal nearly always, for it is the favored part. The flipper is like two, and the leg above the flipper fore and aft. Apart from this, there seem to be no strong preferences, and that is probably also true for the walrus, but I have never lived where they were hunted. Walrus are found only where the ice is in motion all winter and where it keeps breaking into small flows, for unlike the seal, they are unable to gnaw for themselves breathing holes through solid ice. Therefore, they are in the North American Arctic, found only in the west around Alaska, and in the east around the more easternly Canadian islands, Hudson Bay, Labrador, and Greenland. In the whales, from the huge bow head that may be 75 feet long to the beluga or white whale that is no bigger than a walrus, the liking is strong for only, part, for only one part, the skin. 
It is so removed from the beast that half an inch of blubber, blubber still clings to the inside of the hide. This is the renowned maktak, which has been a favorite with many whites who, unlike me, have not taken to other delicacies of the Eskimos. In Charlie Brower's famous station at Barrow, a few miles from the northernmost tip of Alaska, which has been visited by every traveler in that region since he first went there in 1884, the hospitality has always been famous. A special part of it is that the guest is served a spice pickle, which he likely will say is about the best he ever tasted. Maktak done up by a secret recipe brought there or devised by Brower's colleague Fred Hobson. The Mackenzie people did not get many birds and seemed to have no market preference as to parts. In fish, they considered the head best and the tail next best. In some fishes, they were especially fond of the liver. Fish heads and fish livers were always eaten boiled, which was indeed the usual form of cooking. But the tastes described seem to apply only when one is living mainly or wholly on meat. If, like most people in our cities and even on the farms, a man eats just a little meat along with a lot of other things, then even if he has eaten by the taste of hunting man for a continuous decade, as I once did, he will likely come back again in city or on farm to the preferences of his former years, before he became a hunter. At any rate, that is the way it has been with me, though I do think wistfully of the delights of northern meals and do have still a doubtless a uh, doubtless greater inclination towards boiled meat than I would have had otherwise. But I want my meat boiled northern style, which I learned was also the style of heavily meat-eating Plains Indians. I want it boiled so that the outside of each meat is cooked, but the inside is pink. It is hard for me to see how anybody can like boiled meat to pieces, our fashion, and I am not surprised to notice that few do. Among the Eskimos with whom I live, perhaps 80% of the animal food was eaten fresh. There were several kinds of preservation. One of these, freezing, was available only in winter. It kept the food fresh, as the other methods did not. Quick freezing keeps a fish fresh, fresh irrespective of whether it, it is cleaned or not. Small birds freeze so fast in cold weather that they do not taste appreciably strong, even with entrails, and there are no big birds that can be killed in cold weather unless a rare owl or raven. Sales, seals, too, freeze quickly enough to retain freshness of taste. Caribou must have the entrails removed immediately, no matter how cold the weather, and will then freeze fresh even though the skin remains on. Unskinned grizzly bears taint considerably even with the entrails removed, and polar bear bears may taint slightly. Musk oxen taint seriously unless the hide is removed as well as the entrails. All of this, of course, depends on the, ra the rapidity of freezing and varies with the temperature and with the insulating qualities of the coats of different animals. By reason of these cause and precautions, surely less than 5% of the winter-killed food of the pre-white Eskimo became tainted. Summer foods were quite another thing. In many districts, fish were caught throughout the summer in larger quantities than could be consumed. There were two methods of preservation. I saw a typical instance of one method during my first year in the North. Fish ranging from one to three or four pounds in weight were caught in great numbers. They were immediately slit and the entrails removed and were then piled in long windrows back just back from the sea beach and covered with piles of driftwood for protection from dogs and wolves. If there had been June fishing at this place, the fish would have been nearly liquid by fall. Late July catches grew so rotten that a fish might fall to pieces if you tried to handle it. The August catch was pretty high, but toward the end of September, there was so much frost at night and so little thaw during the day that putrefaction ceased. Decayed fish were not eaten, eaten during the warm weather. They were not considered good until frozen. As soon as the freeze-up came, they began to be used as delicacies, sometimes as whole meals. The only way of serving decayed fish was to allow them to thaw in the house until they were soft as hard ice cream. Then they were eaten somewhat as a child would consume an ice cream cone. The taste is similar to that of our strong cheeses. The attitude of the Mackenzie Eskimos towards decayed fish was about that of our fashionable diners toward Camembert or Limburger. When fish are caught rapidly, there is nothing to do but pile them in the windrows. But if the catch is slower, the few not eaten are likely to be split and hung up to dry. Commonly, the backbone is removed and used for dog feed, either then or later. Indeed, fish bones, no matter what the condition of the fish or the method of eating, are mainly dog feed. The mentioned second Eskimo way of preserving fish is wind drying. 
This is seldom carried to such an extent that the, f the flesh become as hard as, uh, as in Scandinavian practice. Usually an Eskimo dried fish is about as soft as our salted cod. When they get to that hardness, they are taken down, piled and covered from rain by water shedding skins. In some districts, a good deal of sand gets into the fish that is being dried, and the teeth of those who eat it are worn down much more rapidly than in other communities. But it seems that no matter how great the wearing of teeth by sand and food, dentin is replaced so rapidly on a carnivorous diet that the teeth nev never get worn down quite to a pulp, and no av avular abscesses are produced. When caribou or other animals are killed in summer, there are, again, two methods of preservation. Sometimes the meat after cooling is placed in pits below the perpetual frost line and covered with grass, loose earth, or sod. Under such conditions, there will be a very slow decay. Meat buried in August, chilled through a month or so, and then frozen in September or October will be only slightly tainted, not nearly so much as properly hung English venison. Caribou meat, which cannot be eaten at once, is somewhat more likely than fish to be wind dried. The process is the same. The flesh is sliced, hung up, and taken down when the outside has formed a dry skin with the inside still soft. This partial drying completely prevents the development of the taste or odor of decay. Some pieces that are exceptionally thin become quite hard, but normally the flesh in is intended to be only partially dehydrated. End note. The, thus, the Eskimo did not produce true jerky, since only occasionally pieces were hard enough to be made into pounded meat, which was therefore unknown to the Eskimo except as produced by the neighboring forest Indians. Nor did they have pemmican, although their atuak, a mixture of boiled meat and rendered fat, has been so miscalled by some writers. In isolated instances, both fish and caribou were sometimes smoke-dried. Eskimo smoking was never systemic, as with some Indians. It might be, for instance, that if ten caribou were killed, the meat of nine would be hung in the open and that of the tenth would be hung within the tent. But this happens only when the people lived in teepee-shaped camps, and there were few of these. The meat of bears and other large animals might be preserved in either of the two ways described for caribou, although drying would be less probable. Some Eskimo communities where eggs were plentiful, pl plentiful never used them at all. For example, the Mackenzie District where geese nest in thousands. End note. This is as of the period before Alaska, Alaska Eskimos came in with the Yankee whalers and popularized egg eating in the Mackenzie District. The first of these whaler, whalers wintered at Herschel Island in 1889. In 1906, my first time in the Arctic, few if any of the local people were fond of eggs, but it was common knowledge that Alaska Eskimos and white men liked them. Western Eskimos who use eggs eat them fresh unless, as sometimes happen, they have they've partly incubated. If there were any Western districts in which eggs were preserved till they became quote unquote high, these were on the fringes of the Eskimo world where outside the where, where outside fashions prevailed. The eating of eggs in all states is common in Greenland and elsewhere in the East. If we compare the whole diet of a strictly carnivorous group of Eskimo with the carnivorous portion of our diet, they would be found to eat, on average, a high, percentage, a high percentage of raw or rare meat than we do. But if we compare our whole diet with theirs, remembering that our milk and cream are sometimes raw, our fruit and vegetable frequently raw, our eggs, usually soft cook, while Eskimos invariably cook theirs hard, and that our roasts are more rare than theirs, though their boiled meat is more rare than ours. If we consider the whole picture, we doubtless use nowadays a hot, far higher percentage of uncooked food than did the pre-white Eskimo world. The Eskimos cooked whenever convenient. If they breakfasted on raw food, it was either because the group did not want to waste time in cooking or else because they awoke with too keen an appetite. Pre-white cooking was usually slow, requiring two or three hours. The same would be true for lunch. At dinner time, in the Eskimo way of life, there was ample leisure, and this meal was seldom eaten raw. The fourth meal of the day, just before going to bed, normally consider, consisted of cold, boiled food left over from dinner. 
Some Eskimos eat a good deal of dried food and others never taste it for years or decades. There are also pronounced variations of diet in other ways. Some groups, for example, hardly ever have any appreciable amount of food except fish, while others seldom taste fish, living chiefly on the flesh of mammals. No frying was ever practiced before Europeans came. Apparently, frying is a rare form of cooking among uh, indigenous people everywhere. Roasting was occasional and usually by Eskimos who lived in forested districts. Even in the woods, boiling is a normal method, while on seacoasts or at sea, it is practically the only form.